Hi, everybody. It's Peter Emily again, Vice President of Customer Success at ESG, and welcome to another edition of Customer Success Unlocked. It's ESG's monthly webinar series. It's a series uh, which uh, means we're on a mission to answer a burning question customer success practitioners everywhere ask themselves, am I in the right line of work? Uh, our webinar series is intended to be an opportunity to tackle important customer success topics and we believe that they need additional exploration. So we're seeking depth in the discourse and we want substance without ego. So we enlist guests who have experience doing the things customer success should be doing. People who have ideas and most importantly, people who have a generosity of spirit and are eager to share their points of view. We believe we may, if we make good choices, then this webinar series can help our audience members nudge the needle of business back home in their jobs. A bit of housekeeping. Uh, maybe join the chat and tell us where you're calling in from. We always, always appreciate seeing that. Uh, we'll have about 50 minutes of conversation, um, in which then I'll we'll leave some time for uh, some Q&A. Um, but feel free at any time to throw a question into the Q&A window. I'll be scanning it and I'll bring the question in if the moment um, resonates for me that it makes sense for the conversation. So let's get started. The title of today's webinar is, What Can a CMO Tell Customer Success About Customer Value? Apparently, a great deal. During the hour, we'll be talking about how customer success evolved during the time of Gainsight's significant growth, how marketing principles and methods offer pathways for customer success to successfully scale, how cross-organizational alignment is possible and is not a concern exclusive to customer success, how customer success leaders should learn lessons from their marketing peers when it comes to tracking and measuring effort and in making the case for expanded investment. Our guest for this conversation is Anthony Canada, who is the co-founder and CEO of Audience Plus. His company is pioneering the industry's first owned media software for marketers, enabling companies to build, engage, and monetize an owned audience. They believe that every company is becoming a media company, and Audience Plus is creating software, content, and community to help. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Peter. Excited to be here. Thanks for joining me. Tell us first about your company, Audience Plus. Uh, what's its purpose? And for additional context, you put into LinkedIn post a couple of weeks ago um, something that argues that own media is more effective than paid. Uh, since this is a webinar attended mostly by customer success professionals, maybe you can perhaps give us a quick education of the differences while you're telling us about your company. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. So um, I'll, I've been in marketing for a while now, about 12 years or so. And what, what I've seen is, you know, for the first, you know, several generations of our practice, um, we have tried to automate marketing. Marketing automation was the language that that we've used and so in practice, what, what did that mean? It mean we tried to really, it means we really tried to focus on transactional customer acquisition. Um, so we tried through Google advertising would be an example of paid media, right? Where we pay per click and we try to get them to fill out a form. And then as soon as they fill it out, we put them on a six email drip and, and three SDRs or SDRs hounding them kind of, you know, for three calls. And that's, and we're kind of like, almost like bullying these leads into taking a phone call with us. And by the way, like uh, customer success ends up being the sort of recipient of that sort of relationship that started in such a transactional kind of means. Um, and what we found over time is this just isn't working anymore. I think buyers are getting smarter. So they're like, we're just not going to fill out any forms or click on ads because we don't want to be enrolled in that, um, that cadence. Um, and so paid media is becoming more ineffective. It's also more expensive. Um, as a marketer, it's one of the largest line items in the marketing programs budget. If you think about the way we're spending money outside of people on the program side, paid is always kind of the top, the top bill. And of course, in this economic climate, it's just not, not working. So the, when we're not talking about paid in marketing, we're talking about organic, which is basically saying free. How can we kind of leverage other algorithms to get access to our audience. Um, and some ways we we talk about that's through the lens of SEO. So writing content for the Google search algorithm to hopefully drive enough qualified traffic to maybe convert one to 2% of that traffic into a lead um, or the social algorithms on LinkedIn and on these other platforms where one change in the algorithm uh, leads to a much lower 
level of impressions. We might've all felt that in our own postings. Like you post mm -hmm. a link to a webinar and you might get 400 impressions and then you do something you know, randomly and you get 4,000. You're like, oh, what did I do differently here? And so what we're seeing is for the last generation of marketing, we've been paying for access to our audience for transactional customer acquisition, or we've been renting access through these third-party algorithms um, for again a, a fairly transactional outcome. And so what we what I've um, what what we've decided to build with Audience Plus is this belief that we're moving to much more of a relational way to go to market. Um, that the way we acquire customers has a downstream impact on how on their lifetime value and on the the relationship between the brand and the the, the human, the person, the the audience member, the customer. Uh, and so we think owned media is a great sort of um, path of doing so and and happy to, to talk in, in, in greater detail, but we're effectively building a platform that allows folks to distribute content, um, video content events just like this, um, you know, written content, research, whatever, build a subscriber type of relationship with, with um, their audience. And then understand all of the first party data around how they're engaging with our content and what topics they care about, um, what distribution channels they're discovering our content and so on. So if you can sort of think about a relational version of a Marketo or HubSpot, you know, to the power of machine learning, that's that's ultimately what we're building. Is it, can it be, well, not compared precisely, but maybe like writers on Substack. Um, exactly right who have an audience um, who are subscribing to them and they're appealing to this, um, a smaller um, community versus when they, yeah. maybe they were writing for a newspaper or a magazine or something like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. We often refer to it as like Substack for the enterprise. Like what Substack's doing for creators and journalists, you want brands, companies to be able to do for their audiences as well. And I imagine um, this sort of strategy would be, uh, appealing to people who are seri seriously thinking about their ICP. How do you kind of refine it? How do you kind of continue to kind of zero in on it and measuring it and all that stuff? That's right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So we first met, I think, 10 years ago, 2013. Uh, you were, I think you just recently joined um, Gainsight at the time. I was at BMC Software. I was in charge of um, a big chunk of customer success at that company at the time. And one of the things I was doing was looking for a tool. Um, and uh, I already had familiarity with with Gainsight because um, when I was at Eloqua, we used Jay Barra, which was the right. forerunner right. to Gainsight. And that's when I met Nick and Dan. And, not Nick, but actually Dan. I spent a lot of time yeah. with Dan at the time. Yeah. So question for you. Uh, can you share with the audience how it felt to join Gainsight at that early stage of that company and what yeah. your impressions were of the customer success profession at the time. Uh, yeah. Also, um, I just added on just before our call, I added on to this question. How did Gainsight's laser focus on the emerging customer success business function influence or dictate the way you thought about marketing strategy for yeah. Gainsight? Totally. Uh, I'm going to try to keep myself time limited here because this is a, a, a longer story. Uh, <laughs> And one I'm very passionate about. Um, uh, so one thing to re remember is this was my first marketing job ever. Um, <laughs> so I've been a product manager before right, that right, at right. Scantech, and I'd spent some time in sales before that at Box. Um, and so I joined Jay Barra. Um, That's my offer letter before we rebranded. Oh, to I, cool. Um, I to, you know, Nick had just joined as a CEO, and he brought me in to kind of run marketing. So I'll start by saying I didn't bring a lot of bias into the marketing kind of impact and, and, and how we would um, how we would, you know, make, you know, help support kind of the community and, and drive demand and all that good stuff. Um, but the other so just a, it felt terrifying and amazing and awesome at the same time. Um, but what we first did, the first move we did in trying to wrap our heads around the business was kind of counter-cultural. We talked to analysts. That was our first move. And I'm talking like the the, the Gartner, Forrester, you know, folks. And we approached, we pitched them. We did a demo, kind of a briefing or whatever. Um, we got them on the phone with some of our customers. And what we noticed was each analyst firm had sort of a practice that aligned kind of somewhat to what we were doing. And they were encouraging us to position Jay Barra at the time as a product for that practice. And so proactive customer support was one category that we were sort of, um, you know, 
being wedged into. The other one was CRM. We're like, hey, this is like a you know CRM type thing. And, and as we all know on this call, neither of those like really felt right uh, for various reasons. And so we started looking. So I think there was, and Peter, you might remember better than I, there was a group that Michael Blaisdell led, still leads, I think, on LinkedIn called the Customer Success Managers Association. Yeah. Association. Yes, thank you. Um, and what we we joined just opportunistically, kind of heard about it. Um, I think there were like a hundred or so people in the group. It was very very small at the time, and they were hosting right around the time we were kind of doing all, having these conversations. A meetup in Redwood City, kind of or what Redwood Shore is one of the kind of office parks. And so we went just to kind of observe and be flies on the wall. And what we noticed was there was this, I can't say it any other way, this energy in the room. And I'm talking like a, a corporate office park, very bland pizza and beer. There was no like, you know, lights and fog machines or whatever, but you felt this feeling of, oh my gosh, I'm finally around other people yeah. who are going through what I'm going through. And that was, you know, we got goosebumps. It was like a, something that we couldn't, shake that there's something here. So, so the decision point for us was, do we go with Gartner and Forrester and position Jay Barra eventually Gainsight as like a support product or a CRM product or something along those lines, or do we just find a way to just be a part of whatever it is that's happening here around this customer success thing? Again, you know, triple digit type of, of Tam, I think at the time, or at least it seemed by name, um, and so we we felt kind of taking the more emotional path was was the better one. Um, and so what we did was we planned an event and we're like, all right, if this event was so powerful, what would it look like if we did an event, poured a little bit of venture capital dollars behind it and, and, and helped kind of make it a, a broader thing. So the company was still called Jaybera Software. We were rebranding to something. We didn't land on Gainsight. We knew it had something to do with, which was wrong at the time, ended up being wrong health, customer health, like going mm -hmm. off of that analogy. And so yeah. we called it pulse because we're like, there's something to like, we'll probably land on calling the company, like something around the health metaphor. So we'll call the event pulse. We were wrong. Uh, we called the gain site. Um, and so we launched pulse as um, an event for customer success professionals, all about best practices from this no nothing, like no name company, basically. And we leveraged some relationships to get like Aaron Levy there and Jeffrey Moore there. And that was sort of the, um, the underpinning for the agenda. Awesome. And, and that, that's kind of what, what made everything happen because we went to that event, of course, and it was, it was magic. I think you might've been there, Peter, but I, I, I was, I was, it was, you know, and, and you talked about the emotion part of it. And I think you guys were super smart to key in on that um, and not ignore, but to kind of marginalize the advice of the, of the kind of, you know, agencies, because, I mean, I'd been in customer success for a while. And and before that, even when I was in sales, I was more like an, a technical account manager. Um, and and I had and I had the experience of actually helping customers achieve success. So I knew there was something there. Um, even as I was moving into like customer success roles, I, I'd had that experience. I wanted to kind of relive it. And so when you guys had that energy um kind of crystallize and start capturing the market, I was yeah. on board. Um, awesome. Because it, it felt like you guys were really meeting the need I had um, for reliving that experience of having those wildly successful customers through my own kind of efforts, not with a tool necessarily, but I, I knew a tool would help people. Sure. So. And that was the bet was, you know, no one here knows about our product or like has heard of it or whatever. We only had like five customers at the time or something. Yeah. But if we were to champion this persona, like, what would that look like? Could we sell some software over time? And that was our, you know, your, your second part of your question was around the marketing learnings is we went all in. We didn't go to the paid media playbook or whatever. We're like, we're just going to serve this persona through content and community and media and all of these sorts of things. Um, and I think it made, made all the difference for us. Yeah. I'm going to bring in a question actually really early. It's the first time I brought a question in from the audience so early yeah. in the conversation, but I think it's a good one. Uh, Nina um, asked a, a question and she wants to hear a little bit more about your career path, but she gives it a little bit more um, context. Uh, so what advice would Anthony give to others in customer success that are curious about the other tracks and what skills would make a candidate stand out these days? And I think because of your, your background um, from product 
management yeah. um, and marketing. And then you obviously became an expert during Gainsight years in customer success too. Yeah, for, uh, for me, I started as an SDR um, at 21 years old at Box. Um, and that was kind of the launch of, of my kind of enterprise SaaS career, I guess. Um, went on to BD. So I kind of, I, you know, no, dis- it's actually one of the harder jobs, harder jobs kind of in the org being an SDR, but yeah. I, I wanted to do more of the business planning side of things. And so I moved to business development um, where I would basically be in charge of a, a partnership. Uh, and so that's where I met Nick Meta. actually. I was a, a BD manager for um, Symantec uh, okay. at our previous company. So once we got acquired by Symantec, they asked me to come on board to product. And that was a big right turn because I was very go-to-market focused knew nothing about building products. And so I enrolled in like pragmatic marketing. I read everything that I could. And so I think maybe there was a, if there's a learning there around just curiosity around a new function, saying yes to opportunities as they they kind of present themselves. Uh, and so when Nick asked me to join Jbera, I put together a plan around product. Um, and he saw something in me about marketing. Like there, he talks about like this one presentation I delivered or something that he he liked the slides or something to that end. <laughs> Um, and then I found my calling in marketing candidly and, and really, really loved kind of what we were doing. So to answer your question, I, I think, um, from an advice perspective, I do think like the relationships that we make in our career are so important for us to, that are seeing things in us that might be blind spots or stuff we don't see in ourselves, taking risks for opportunities that might be maybe not, not obvious, um, and then having that curiosity to upskill in the areas where, where we're lacking. I'm, I'm doing it as a founder now, certainly t- learning how to upskill. Um, but I, from a CS perspective, starting with that kind of powerful foundation, I mean, Nick said on stage many a time that CCOs are the next CEOs. Yeah. And I deeply believe it because the, you know, I'm, I'm starting a business now trying to make marketers effectively more customer centric in, in a way. I know we're going to talk about that in depth. But you're starting from that strong foundation. And I think that you're on the right side of history to impact all of the various functions that can benefit from customer empathy, relational kind of building, appreciation for data around kind of you know health scoring and, and usage and, and sentiment and all these things. So um, I think that I'm not just pandering to, or to, to the audience, but I think this group is uniquely positioned to do whatever you want to do kind of if you do want to you know, take a, t- take another, uh, off ramp from the CS kind of, uh, org. No, that's, that's, that's good, uh, advice. I think is to be open to that. It's important also to acknowledge, um, and I, and I say this in the sense that in my career, long career, I can count on one hand, I think bosses or leaders who I believe were truly authentic and trying to grow people, and take yeah. chances on people. And I think you, we need to acknowledge that Nick is a special guy, right? I mean, yeah. he's, he's got a fantastic reputation, but that's a good illustration of what you talked about of, of how that came into play for you. Yeah. And he gave you an opportunity. So totally. And and by the way, if you're if you're later in your career, kind of listening to to this, like this is a chance for us to like look out for the yeah. next generation kind of a thing and, and pay it forward. Um, so I, I, I will never be like Nick because he is otherworldly in terms of his skills, but I aspire to be like him and be able to, um, make an impact on other people's careers, just like he's made on mine. Well, we don't need another Nick anyways. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you were with, like, stick with Gainsight just for a bit more. Yeah. Uh, you were with Gainsight for over seven years, uh, obviously an integral decision maker in the rocket ship that took off there. Uh, congratulations. Um, it's been my opinion since even before I met you that customer success should lean more heavily uh, into adopting marketing principles uh, and tactics to better understand customers and also to you know extend the reach um, and effectiveness of that reach in order to scale the CS organization at large. And honestly, for I felt like I was wandering in the wilderness for almost 10 years there, um, but not anymore. I feel like it's being that mindset is, is is being adopted more broadly now and so from your role as a as the cmo during those years and given you and given you are more at arm's length now um from customer success you know you're still kind of involved in terms of customer centricity can you share how you viewed customer success teams adopting marketing principles and methods during that time yeah i mean it's evolved to your point i i can appreciate the wilderness kind of feeling because 
um, at Gainsight early, earlier in the Gainsight journey. I think we got a little bit closer as I was there, but there, there were, there were two things. First, um, incentives were misaligned. And so we were very much measured in marketing in terms of net new lead gen pipeline. So we'd put 95 to hundred percent of our effort on that. And so when there was an ask from C from the CS team or sort of like a cross-functional initiative, we would be operating either from the 5% capacity that we could open up to support that initiative or get into the margins, right? So there was definitely, not, I wouldn't say an us versus them, but there was definitely like a pretty clear line of delineation where we were focused on pipeline. And if we could help CS, we'd help them, so, 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 to, so to speak. Earlier days, I guess, I, I think things have gotten a lot better. Second is there was actually some lightweight conflict when things, because of that, uh, that would line up. So for example, um, email campaigns. So there were ideas, so marketing typically owns like the marketing automation stack and we'll send emails to the entire database for upcoming events or newsletters or all these types of things. And Gainsight has this feature. I think every tool, every platform at this point likely has a, a feature where you email customers based on certain health context or certain kind of playbooks that you might have kind of built within the, the platform. And so we'd have these situations come up where customers were getting hit by Gainsight overall four times in a week, whether it was operational emails, marketing emails, you know, CS campaigns that we were blind to in marketing. So that led to a little bit of sort of air traffic control issues around communications and campaigns. Um, so that was, I think, the state that we were in, um, at least at Gainsight. And I don't know if that, if others have seen something similar kind of within their businesses. But I think a few things have happened since. Um, in very recent history, um, we're in a really tough season right now to generate pipeline <laughs> from yeah. our marketing perspective. And so not only that, um, our teams are a lot leaner than they were uh, 24 months ago. Um, expectations are just as high, if not higher, to deliver growth, ultimate like revenue for the company. And so as we talk to other CMOs, we just had this event for, for CMOs uh, two weeks ago in, in, in the Bay Area. Part of the big conversation was how do we shift our focus from this sort of pipeline orientation to sort of more of an LTV kind of mindset? How can we help drive adoption marketing? How do we help drive kind of renewals and upsell campaigns? So now I think what you're starting to see is, I think Peter, probably the vision you had, you know, back in the day, starting to come to life, but I think it's coming to life because marketing is being blown up. Like the, the mm -hmm. marketing as we know it is being completely transformed and we're moving closer to CS. And hopefully we haven't burned too many bridges to come back <laughs> to, to a closer partnership, but yeah. definitely was an us thing. And I think now we're starting to see much more, much closer alignment than we have in, in previous generations. Yeah, I'm connected with a lot of marketing leaders on LinkedIn. I have conversations with quite a few of them. And I see that um, quite a bit. The, the language um, is more sprinkled now with LTV and there's an appreciation for, you know, it's not to say that these people, you know, only found the light now. I think they've probably known for a long time. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I think the incentives and, and the way their structure of the organizations are, yeah. people do their roles, right? And even leaders do their roles. And you try to kind of respect boundaries and all that kind of stuff. And I think this is an exciting time, I find, in business because you're right. I think marketing is being blown up. Customer success is, in the, is always in the middle of being blown up. And, and it feels like, you know, nothing ever really gets, will get settled. And even when it gets settled, is that really settled? I mean, We'll yeah. see. Right? The business evolves. So. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I yeah. think um, um, the what, what's really interesting is the um, the the incentives are starting to change, which is giving mm -hmm. me hope. Though, in that we're starting to see CMOS being also measured in, in addition to pipeline on net retention as part of their overall um, mix. And it, for other companies, it might be different, but that's the common one that I'm seeing. Um, and so the benefit is, you know, that forces conversation, right? You know, you're, you're spending a little bit more time with your CCO um, versus just talking to sales or, or your CRO. Um, so I think that's going to be a, a good signal for us too. Yeah. And, and what I like about, um, you know, marketing really increasing its abilities in this space is that it's going to raise the bar 
for customer yeah. success leaders um, to become much more fluent um, in really what does customer outreach mean and how do you measure that? And, and just because you've done um, tactics a certain way for 10 years, you don't know if that's the right way to go anymore. And so you yeah. need to figure out well, what's really going to resonate with your audience. And so uh, that leads me to the next question. I think um, when people think of marketing, I would say the phrase customer value delivery is not normally something that's associated with marketing, but you probably have a different take. And I, again, I keep bringing up Gainsight because I think that's a unique company. It's because of the customer success platform provider. Yeah. It had to be around the customer. It had to be about the customer. Totally. So what are the ways that a marketing executive thinks about customer value and how can that kind of thinking uh, help customer success professionals? Is there something that yeah. they can offer to, um, you know, assist here? Yeah. I'm trying to, um, close off the part of my brain as a founder CEO, because it's a lot different now because now okay. all I think about really is customer value delivery, or at least, you know, that's kind of the bottom line of, of what we're, what I'm obsessed with. Um, but as a CMO, you're right. That's not language that we really think about. Like we hit the pipeline target and we move on to the next thing. And that's kind of been the, um, you know, it's a bit of a cartoon caricature of, of our practice, but really is kind of what, what's been driving it. Um, where, where we did see some overlap um, was probably in a few areas. One was participation from customers in our marketing programs. Uh, and especially at Gainsight, like we cared very deeply that our customers came to the conference and and were participating in our, I don't know, webinar programs or, or whatever the case is. We measured that um, because we thought of our content and community programs as a unit of value beyond our products and services. Um, and so that that was in our reporting, that was in our conversations uh, with, with leadership and all these types of things. Um, I think that's the first big one. The second one, of course, gets into a little bit of the customer marketing bit with like advocacy and referrals and mm -hmm. storytelling around, around case studies. Um, some of that stuff can feel transactional too. And so I think, you know, when we really push on it and, and think about value, the case study is less about, it's more about us as the brand than it is about the customer. But we had this opportunity as marketers to make the customer a hero, to make the customer feel like an innovator in this new market, this new practice that, that we're in. And so that's probably where more of the value was created, wasn't just, hey, let us have this like PDF or, or this thing on our website, but it was more of come speak in front of an audience and share your story. And we're going to promote that as like this kind of you know, innovation or this, this kind of leading thought leader behind this, this emerging practice of customer success. Um, so it was a bit more subtle, I think, but, I, but the, that's where we really ultimately, like we, ultimately, I think that's what made Gainsight what it was. It wasn't just like Nick, Nick's a huge contributor. So I'm not taking away from that one, one iota, but we really put our customers at the center of the movement, mm -hmm. and not even just our customers, prospects, folks who, who we sort of just built a stage and put them on it and let them kind of share their stories. And I think there was a value kind of created there that's relational, that is very hard to codify uh, in, yeah. in a dashboard, right? Or something to that end. Yeah, no, I like that. I think that's a great description. Um, and Maybe it was unique to Gainsight again because of the, the market it was in, the customers it was trying to serve. But I think you guys did a fantastic job of, as you say, putting the customer front and center and making them feel like they're at a they're in a story, a unique story in time. And that's how I felt, anyways. And I think I'm not yeah. alone in believing that. Yeah. Um, but you know, you mentioned um, you want to set aside your CEO role, but maybe you can speak to that right now about yeah. customer value from from your audience plus CEO position. I'm just so grateful to have sat shotgun to the Gainsight story for years and the CS industry that again, I'm, I'm certainly not a practitioner or expert in CS, but I just from osmosis have, have yeah. seen so much. Um, my, my, one of my first five hires at the company was a CS uh, person. Uh, we only have 12 
hires now and we have two CS people. Mm. Uh, and the idea for me is like, we want to build everything we're talking about here, just like the the purity of, of the intention behind the CS practice into the foundation of the business. So from customer number one um, to hopefully, you know, a hundred thousand million, whatever, um, we've are, we're thinking about value delivery. We're thinking about how they can feel like a part of what we're building, you know, with product feedback, with um, advocacy opportunities, even in our earliest stage here. Um, so, you know, I'll make it very tactical, very practical. We're in the seat. We've raised a seed round. Our next chapter is a series A. The mm-hmm. exit criteria for a series A, there's, there's a few depending on who you talk to, but the main one that no one will debate is customers who love you and are willing to go on the record and talk about the value that they're receiving from your product. So there is no raising that next round without that. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we're over indexed on, you know, things. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, when you're an early product, like there's a lot of things wrong with it <laughs> and then it's a small team to, to react and resolve it. And so I'm very grateful for having amazing CS folks on the team because we have to be able to, a, recruit the right customers that are willing to go on the journey with us, B, that we're responsive to when things inevitably go wrong, um, but that C, we're also kind of building enough relational um, equity with them that they're willing to kind of be a part of the bumps and bruises until they get to a point of, of true true value. So so yeah, it's evolved. I mean, first it was like, yeah, how do we hit the pipeline target? I do care about customers, but I really got to hit the pipeline target to our company's going to die if we don't take care of our customers and support them. And that's the posture that I bring into the, um, into the CEO role now. Is, is, the, um, is the current climate or the, the last year anyways, uh, making it where it's difficult to raise capital, is that driving more scrutiny at that stage then or no? Uh, where I'm seeing more scrutiny is on like, they want revenue now. Yeah. <laughs> It's been like we've always needed revenue, but the last two years, I think we've all gotten punch drunk a little bit on on venture capital. Yeah. Um, that you could just do a series or a um, um, you know, seed round, have a couple customers they could pay or not pay, and now you can go raise like a $20 million series yeah. A. Those days are gone, so yeah. now you need some material revenue, some ROI to actually go get the round. Um, but, but I think even back then caring about the cost, like what, what series A investors want to do is talk to customers. Um, you know, the rest is sort of like um, su- uh, secondary supplementary kind of diligence, but number one is, is the customer value for sure. So investors are getting smarter. In other words, yeah, they are, they are which is good for all of us in the long run. So let's, um, let's pivot a little bit to um, organizational alignment. So you've met a lot of enterprise leaders in the last 10 years. Uh, that probably goes without saying, yeah. Um, you know, as a marketing professional during all that time, um, I think you probably have a unique perspective of how businesses operate just based on your kind of observation. So how are companies that that have found most success in your mind managing to collaborate and coordinate effort between organizations, you know, the effort that produces measurable results in order to deliver value for the customer? So how are they doing it? that and when you look at others it seems that people struggle organizations struggle yeah i mean i've i've also had a few other stops since gainsight and so i've seen firsthand um you know the right way of doing things kind of the wrong way of doing things as well um i think the way i sort of internalize the learnings again both from experience firsthand and talking to others is we need the best of breed companies have a shared vision for success. Um, and every, there's a million different methodologies, right? I actually have a book here on my desk. Uh, we use the EOS Entre- entrepreneur operating system traction. Mm-hmm. There's a million of them, right? So everyone pick your own kind of uh, formula, but the idea at the end of the day is the leadership team can get together, understand where we're headed as a business um, and run kind of, you know, planning processes against that goal and then cascade that information down to the team. Because one of the big issues that a lot of companies are finding is like, we're either all running in different directions Mm -hmm. or we're not giving enough um, autonomy to the folks doing the work to actually see how their work is tying to the the business goals. 
Um, and so there's an element of communication there. Uh, there's an element of planning. There's an element of resource um, allocation. I think, especially in this market, you know, there's there's just not a, not as much budget to go around as there was 24 months ago. And so, are we signing our team up for impossible goals and not giving them enough, you know, dollars, whether it's on the program or people side, to actually execute the, those goals? That leads to burnout, and then we lose te- our, our our teammates, and you know, things are are you know, pretty quickly kind of get out of hand from there. So um, I think it all starts this idea of developing a shared vision um, and then being able to cas- communicate that and cascade that down to the team. Um, I'll tell you, you know, sample size of one, I saw the before in our own business on not having that and now seeing the after and it's just transformative. Mm-hmm. Uh, so certainly for us, we're a very small company, but in the enterprise, I would, I would say the same is true. Yeah. And I think um, the key as the company gets larger is that the layers of management and leaders populate those seats um, need to be really good communicators. Um, yeah. I think they can't just be good kind of practitioners having done the job. They actually have to be over rotate on to really great communications to tie that when you talk about the goals to the com- company vision and all that, that's really powerful if it can be done. So, yeah. 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 There's an, and I do feel like we've never needed that more than now. Um, yeah. idea of internal stakeholder um, alignment and, um, you know, putting the marketing hat a little bit motivation even. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there, it's really important to over, over index on internal comms around uh, initiatives or, or just the work that we're doing every day. Yeah. It's just, people need reminders um, uh, as they're doing kind of the day-to-day stuff, how that's connected uh, to the, to the mission at, at large. Yeah. So um, what are your thoughts on customer marketing as a distinct function? Um, yeah. You know, part of me sees it. Um, well, let me just finish the question. So is it necessary? Does its existence as a distinct function within customer success signal something about uh, the inadequacies of marketing's ability to kind of look at customers. So, or are we witnessing some sort of a turf war at this time? So it's a hot one. We got a hot one here. Um, it, I think it goes back to earlier discussion too, right? Like customer marketing in my experience as a marketing leader has reported into marketing, hmm. but it's reported into like you have the CMO you have the departmental leads, you've got like product marketing typically. And under product marketing down here somewhere, you've got customer marketing. Yeah. And just that visual, that that picture of that org, org chart tells you everything. Yeah. When the team is like driven by, incentivized to drive pipeline, customer marketing is like a manager managerial role kind of within the marketing stack. Uh, now we think about that role also traditionally through the lens of content creation, um, how many case studies did we create back in the day? It was influitive. Like what does our advocate kind of hub look like and what kind of engagement are we driving there? Maybe it's how many customers did we feature on a webinar or speak at our event or whatever. And that's how we defined customer marketing. So I think what we saw the turf war starting to emerge in customer success was like, Hey, that's great. You guys keep doing that, but we need someone that is thinking about the life cycle of the customer. I, I, I've heard different language around this digital CS, maybe some other things where how can we use data around our customer health in order to drive CS outcomes, be it adoption, renewals, you know, wh- whatever the case may be. And so we kind of drew the line there. We, I think, I think the language we used was advocacy and adoption. Yeah. Advocacy was marketing. Adoption was, was the CS role. Um, so I think that's what it was. And I think in many cases, it's probably what it is today. I'm not sure you guys would have better experience than I, but I imagine it's probably fairly similar. Yeah. Um, and what we want to do now as part of this, I think, reawakening happening in marketing is like, oh, <laughs> wait a minute. We're actually pretty good at creating content in marketing. Um, we're pretty decent at distribution of that content, but the aims have been around new pipeline creation. How can we support our CS team, wherever it lives, candidly. I'm not, I'm not sure what the best answer is there. Um, if you get the incentives right, it could work in marketing, but if not, then we need to be like a support organization to CS um, to help you all deliver your outcomes. But we can bring to the table what we do best around content and creativity and, and campaigns and all of that to drive adoption marketing, to drive 
you know, a kind of renewals process, uh, or if you have customers that are at risk, how can we help create programs that, that support kind of getting them back on track? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, but it's a good point. I don't know where, I, I think for a C, for a CMO who is fully locked in to driving top of funnel pipeline, um, it should live in CS probably because you're just never going to give it the attention it deserves to actually mm-hmm. make it, make it work. Um, so that's, that's, I think the heart of the question is the incentives. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I, I think you, you hit on at the end, I think the, to be successful in customer marketing, you actually have to have really good proximity to the data about the customer's ability to adopt the solution because you want uh, your marketing effort to land yeah. uh, with a lot of precision um, in and what is essentially a captive audience, we're not talking yeah. about the broad market. We're talking about, you know, you've already got these customers. You already have the license to talk to them. You just don't yeah. want to blow it. You don't want to overdo it. You want it to make it important for them and meaningful. So, um, yeah, I think at this moment, it feels like the the proximity to data is what's what matters. And so my customer marketing probably does belong right at this moment of customer success. But... I feel like marketing, going back to what we said earlier, is broadening its horizons in a smart yeah. way. And I yeah. think that there's probably room there for them to kind of learn um, yeah. how to really engage better on the post-sales world and yeah. really deliver value there. So Maybe a way to think about it. I love that proximity to data kind of idea. Like who in marketing today is waking up every day obsessed over right. product utilization or whatever, right? Whatever is feeding kind of the your customer analytics. I think the answer in 95% of companies is no one. Um, and that should be an interesting <laughs> kind a... of leading indicator for us on, on, on that. Yeah. Um, so marketing needs to get better at that for sure, but also we need to support you all on, on that in a much more material way. Yeah. And I think your company um, and it's what it's wanting to do in the market will, will be helpful uh, yeah. for uh, definitely for post sales organizations. Um, so let's go to a really important topic for customer success individuals, um, leaders anyways, how do you advise a customer success professional on how to ask for investment from the executive leadership team? Uh, Sorry, I lost a little. How how to ask for, uh, investment from the leadership team. From a CS perspective. It's a good question. Um, I... You know, I think CMOs have, have asked for investment a lot. Uh, we've developed a good thick skin talking to CFOs and FP&A. Um, we're used to the red pen coming out after we do ask for stuff. And, and that's kind of why I'm asking the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, I mean, at the end of the day, some of the, if I, if I answer that question to a marketing leader, what I would say is one, it has to be able to be measurable your investments. Like otherwise like it's very harder now to get people to like take a flyer on a, an idea that we can't measure success uh, in, uh, in marketing. At least there's a lot of those, um, Hey, we're going to go do this. You know, we're going to spend a hundred grand on a video and put it on YouTube or something like, all right, well, how are we going to know that that's actually driving any impact? Um, second is, the outcomes need to point somewhere on the funnel. Um, so it can't just be like, we can increase traffic by 300%. Great. Not helpful. Like how much more pipeline, how many more opportunities, how, what's our, how's this going to improve our close rate? How do we talk to the funnel and the outcomes rather than the leading indicators? Mm-hmm. And three, I think what's most helpful too is, um, programs that can dial up or dial down based on kind of the, the signals. So, uh, paid was, a channel that kind of presented with that promise um, where, Hey, if it's working, we can turn it up. If not, we can turn it down. Um, but what is sort of the variability in the the spend that can help a CFO kind of wrap their head around uh, what we're doing. So I think all of those things would be true for the CS team as well. Um, maybe one just like timely kind of thing that may not always be the case, but at least in marketing, what we can't do this year is the same thing we did in previous years and expect a different result because we've been doing some crazy things in terms of how we've been spending money in terms of like, you know, a lot of brand or corporate marketing investments that we can't measure impact on. 
And it was like, okay, as long as finance was looking at our like CAC to LTV ratio and said, all right, this is fine, like go for it. Like that's not the world we're living in anymore. So I do think there is this appetite for new ideas. Um, so long as it fits that criteria that, that we talked about. Um, but I think there is open-mindedness from where the CFO is sitting on trying things so long as they're not like material investments that, you know, we can track progress, that it impacts an outcome. Um, and, you know, for, for CS, I think the analogy might be, you know, around probably net retention, like how, Hey, that, I think that's something every CFO has top of mind today. Yeah. Um, I think you're um, you, you're reminding me of the conversation I just had yesterday um, mm-hmm. with with our team. We were on a call with a, a key client, and the CEO was on the call of that client. And mm-hmm. it was refreshing to hear him talk about what he hopes. He didn't. He wasn't specific. He wanted us to be provide the specifics, and we did um, sufficiently enough that he was pretty excited at the end of the call because I think the picture we painted for him was something new it wasn't it's because his issue was retention uh and so there's lots of ways you can attack retention but i think he wanted to hear something fresh and and he provided it and so we were pretty thrilled at the end of the call i think because he was so i think to your point the moment is here where probably the leaders are hoping to see something new that's right okay measure it yeah. And that's what we're seeing with our, you know, our business, like 2023 is not the year to launch a MarTech product, but we're <laughs> approaching things differently. And we're kind of a product that kind of fits into this efficient growth initiative that is happening across marketing teams everywhere. We help you save money. Um, and if you can position your work in that way, then I think that's, uh, you know, that's a big part of um, what gets approved at the end of the day. Right, exactly. So, um, you know, I, again, I've known you about 10 years. I think for me, watching you join the team at Gainsight and the, you're on stage, you had this um, persona that you exhibited, which was really positive. And I think it matched the moment where Gainsight was and where yeah. Gainsight was in this new emerging market of customer success. So, like it was kismet, everything kind of came together for you guys and you executed really well. But I think your who you are was part of that. And, and so I, I I think of you as like this optimistic individual. Oh, wow. And so uh, with all the rapid changes happening, and you just mentioned you launching this MarTech during the, the worst yeah. time. Yeah, so yeah. it takes a person with optimism to do that. So with all the rapid changes happening in the world of business and more specifically in, in business technology, how do you stay hopeful? And, and optimistic with all this AI and everything floating around? Um, that's such a good question. And I appreciate the the observation around, around optimistic. I think, you know, certainly it was hard, was hard not to be um, being in that room, right. Seeing the energy, the excitement, seeing, um, you know, just the passion that all, all what, what I love about the CS community is the um, there's this connection around, empathy and that that I think connects everyone here which is so different I think than a lot of other professions and it's so for as a marketer you know that really filled my batteries up you know being able to to be a part of that um you know I I'll answer maybe the question in a couple ways one we started the company last year when things were a little bit better uh and our messaging, everything was very optimistic. This is the future. It's community led and like relationships over transactions. And it was this whole thing. And when we started pitching it to CMOs, they're like, I can't even think about this right now. Like I am whatever the, I'm pessimistic, right? I am just trying to do more with less. We just laid off our team. I still have to hit the number. I have no idea. Like community led, cool. Like talk to me in a couple of years because I have to survive now. Yeah. And so we shifted a little bit of our tone of our messaging as a, as a company to be a bit more, um, what's the word, like relevant in this in this cultural moment that we're living in. So as a, as a company, as a brand, as a, as a leader in that, I think we have to be authentic and real and represent, I think, the emotions of our audience um just a funny aside you might appreciate this from the gainsight days we we filmed some crazy videos over the years at gainsight we did something called we have a, a campaign we're running now audience plus called emo marketing 
it's a play on email marketing, but it's the early 2000s punk rock, like e emo days. Yeah. Um, and the idea is just to meet our audience where they are and just like complain <laughs> about how hard things are and kind of create this, this sort of um, moment. So I, I guess, again, the marketer kind of company builder in me, I think we have to kind of be authentic uh, and, and represent the, the real feelings of, of the market that we're serving. Um, personally, um, I have had to really shift my relationship with work. If I'm being honest, mm -hmm. I've had a couple of kids at home. Um, uh, my eldest has had her fair share of health issues. Um, my wife is actually pregnant and we're having a, she's having an extremely difficult pregnancy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've had my own stuff like since, since Gainsight. So it, I've had to sort of, you know, just have like a, a deeper understanding of why we work, like what's my why, um, how can I create enough margin in my life? So I'm not falling into pessimism and falling into sort of reaction to the headlines and, and the, you know, the stock mm -hmm. charts and all of that, like, and, able to sort of put work in its place in my broader kind of life. And it doesn't mean that, oh, I'm now doing this as like a lifestyle brand or whatever. We're working really hard, but we're working hard for an outcome. Uh, not, sorry, not a financial outcome. We're working hard for, for an end. Um, and I've had to remind myself of that. And I've had to, you know, create enough time for rest in my life and for disconnection and for, family or whatever it is that's important to, to you all, you know, as you're thinking about this. So, uh, it doesn't come without intention because it's very easy to just keep going. And I think if you do, it's, it's just hard. You, you find yourself kind of heading towards burnout and, and that's a, a bad place to be in this, in this season. Yeah. You know, and I, I do a lot of, um, reading and talking about macro events and how they affect, um, business and specific, specifically customer success and, and your answer there, um, I found hopeful um, because you're taking care of yourself. And I think if more leaders and um, let's just talk about leaders, if they took care of themselves, I think the people would be better taken care of and then customers would be better taken care of. And at, at the end of the day, I think what we want in our world is more peace, yes. <laughs> and contentment. And, and I think the community at large, like the business community, the, the consumer community, to to eliminate or reduce friction as much as possible. And yeah. you can't do that as a company if you're really at odds with yourself. Yeah. And, and, and so I think I think your answer is kind of for me like spot on in the way I think about that that yeah. kind of stuff. So you say, you say put your mask on first, right? Before helping helping others. Like you have to make sure that right. you're you know, there's a cascading effect in terms of how we show up to our teammates, to our customers if we're not taking care of ourselves. So I think that's that's really important. Yeah. So before my final question, I want to get to Nina asked another one. This is pretty uh, tactical, but I think you might have a thought on it. You know, have you speaking to uh, having, she says, speaking of having customers to contact, what is one way you manage to get reconnected with a customer? Yeah. Let's say people call it ghosting or whatever, but sometimes customers just are off, off the charts for some reason or another. You don't really know why, but how do you have an example of how you've been able to reconnect? I do. Um, try not to out the company I was a part of, but I was part of a business that was very product led. Um, and so they did not have a mature CS function at the time and they found a lot of success and they had customers are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars with them. They just had no idea who to call. Um, and some of those, a few of those were on monthly contracts. And as you, know, so you can imagine the, the, the fear of one of them churning. Yeah. And so I remember very specifically, like we got to establish some type of connection here. <laughs> Otherwise, like this, this whole, you know, this whole thing can fall apart. Um, one of the things that I think works pretty well here, um, this is going to sound super biased, but I really do think it's true, is inviting them to participate in a content program. So whether mm -hmm. that's like um, a webinar like this or a, a podcast and we're like, hey, you know, we'd love to feature you on this um you know, podcast, let's say, or video series or something. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all humans and we all have like an ego to us. And I think we're just far more receptive to opening that email. If you put it in the subject line um, to saying yes to an opportunity to share our story. 
Um, and that starts developing relationship and our questions and and the prep and ultimately distribution of that content asset. Like there's, you've got about a, call it a three week kind of relationship there that you're kind of developing that is outside the context of the commercial agreement. But now you're in just a much better place to get them to respond when it comes time to, you know, to an inev- inevitable kind of either churn event or renewal or, or whatever. So I found that, you know, having a podcast as an example, could be anything, again, it could be a video series, it could be webinar programs, just like this, um, has a lot of uh, added benefits beyond just building brand and content marketing and education, but also for relationship building with customers. Yeah, that you guys were good at that at Gainsight. I remember, because even when I wasn't a customer, um, I think you know you had hopes that when I was at Oracle, it would yeah. be a customer again. You know, and Allison invited me twice to be on her podcast, and and I like to think it wasn't just because they hope you guys hoped I was a customer that I had something. Yeah, yeah. To say, but oh, of course, but of I think that's a good example uh, what you provided. Um, yeah, there. and it's so, a win-win, right? And and every yeah. capital because we get to leverage your expertise and brand kind of cachet and your followership from a distribution perspective. So all of it, I think is really, um, it's a very authentic outreach, I guess is how to put it because it's a win for both parties. Well, I didn't feel totally used. So I think (laughs) (laughs) that's good. So um, I'm, I uh, recently in these webinars, the final question, I've, I've stolen the idea from Ezra Klein, who's a writer for the New York times. And he does a fantastic podcast that I listen to all the time. And he always asks the guest to, he says, name three books that you'd recommend. I I don't want to put people through that, but if you have one book you could recommend to this audience, yeah, uh, I think we'd all appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, the one that just going back to the burnout question, a book that was transformative in my life, um, it's called uh, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Um, okay. And, it, you know, disclaimer, there, there is sort of a sort of faith based component to it. But, you know, I think that for anyone that, that would want to read it, it just talks about like, you know, how to actually very tactically create margin in your life. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's something that I appreciated. Um, conceptually, but I didn't really have a good playbook for how to think about things like, uh, you know, like silence and solitude and, you know, these things that are kind of countercultural to the moment that we're living in. We're digitally connected where, you know, the notifications, the dopamine hits and how all of this stuff, we can sort of like find ways to intentionally decouple ourselves from, um, I don't know, these digital tools, appendages that we're, we're, we're attached to. So I think uh, that was a, just a transformative book for me uh, personally. So repeat the name again. A Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And of the hurry. author is uh, John Mark Comer. Okay, thank you. And so I'm not going to I'm not going to see a TikTok on that anytime soon from you, right? <laughs> Probably not. I might do a LinkedIn post at some point about it. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Yeah, Anthony, this was uh, fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and and the energy you brought here. Um, it I think it unfolded the way I hoped it would. So I really, I really, really enjoyed the conversation. I hope the audience did too. Everyone, um, please join us uh, next month or pay attention. Pay attention to, uh, you'll get a notification on LinkedIn, but also through email about our next webinar. And um, look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.